Welcome to Talk Design Podcast, the space where creativity meets conversation. I'm Adrian Ramsey, your host, and as someone deeply entrenched in the world of design, I'm thrilled to introduce you to the minds that inspire me in the hope that they will spark something special within you too. From a design past crafting women's swimwear to pushing the boundaries of performance sportswear, from mountaineering to international yachting, to implementing systematic innovation solutions that transcend boundaries in the aerospace industry. My heart remains rooted in architecture and exploring the emotional tapestry woven by built spaces is my fascination. My journey in design has been what can only be described as a life of design. I want to thank you for lending me your ears. I'm eager to embark on this next episode together. And for those of you who prefer to watch and listen, you can catch this episode at YouTube. That's youtube.com forward slash at Talk Design Podcast. My guest on Talk Design today is Ashley Heron from Lodo, and she can explain Lodo to you. Uh, in Austin, Texas, and I have the great pleasure of interviewing Ashley for the third time, but only two recordings that you can ever hear. This one, and the first one was for the AIA Homes Tour uh, a few years ago, hey, two or three years ago, and the second one, which was just one of the most fabulous conversations, set me up for the rest of the day and the week, I didn't push record on, so we've pushed record this morning. It does happen, 250, 260 episodes, and you're number two. So I know number three is lurking out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Ashley, welcome to the show. Honored to be a a special guest getting to talk (laughs) with you twice in a short period. But truly, it's so much fun talking with you. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm really excited to have you here and excited to share. I'm going to have to make everything feel like I don't know anything again because there are so many cool pieces. I'm going to get you to start out and tell me about the journey, the little Ashley journey. Somewhere in this picture, there was this little girl who decided to become an architect who probably had, I don't even know how many choices of other things that she could have done, Uh, but you can tell us, kick us off. Maybe, but for those of us who get to do something that we really love, I don't know if you have that many choices. It feels like it was always out there for you, but I didn't always know it was architecture. I knew it was something creative. I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. My parents are both from Michigan, from the Detroit area and had moved there just before I was born for their careers and were not what, involved what? in creative industries or both. Yeah. what well, I was about to say, what were their <laughs> careers? And why Las Vegas? I know, right? No, they're both in medicine. And it was really my father's job as a cardiologist right out of residency. He got just the best offer out there. There was nothing particular about it being Las Vegas or the whole gaming industry at all. It was just a growing city. They needed people. So he got a great offer. And they thought, sure, they they had wanted to get away from Detroit. They had both had reasons that they wanted to get a little bit away from home. And so I think the first time they flew in and just saw desert of that particular type, they weren't particularly inspired about the whole location, but thought, (laughs) let's give this a try and we'll stay a few years and then we'll go back to the East coast and make life whatever there. And then that was act like grownups again, five years ago. Yeah. And so they benefited from Las Vegas being this growing city for a, a, a lot of different periods, having some really big growth without ever been directly involved with uh, the gaming industry. But it was interesting just because childhood memories are all the special moments, all the sort of fun activities are on the strip. That's like where the best restaurants were and um, movie theaters were in casinos and bowling alleys were in casinos. And so I was very familiar with that kind of part of the world because that's just what you did. So growing up there, I've never actually even considered this. It's the first time. (laughs) I've been to Vegas quite a few times. I go, growing up there, yeah, you had all that entertainment stuff. Your parents weren't from it, but you got to interact with it all and see building on, I'd say, a grand scale and also on a, 
um, I, I don't even know whether it makes sense, a beyond need scale. Like it, it's a big entertainment thing. And then you've got this amazing desert landscape that surrounds Vegas, like that whole piece of valley yeah. and out towards into California and stuff. And yeah, yeah, but, 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 yeah, and you went to school there, obviously. But as you say, like part of your entertainment scene was the strip. Yeah. And so it's really interesting looking back on that in terms of my understanding of the environment, because I just didn't get it. Yeah. Like I didn't understand that we can intentionally design and look for certain things in our urban environments and our relationship to landscape, because everything is a bit dis or it was at least, I think there's been a lot of improvements overall and as the city's grown, but it was very disjointed, right? There was this image of what Las Vegas is and these sort of cartoon like buildings. Yeah. And then a lot of the rest of the city just springing up out of need and whatever is most efficient and cheap to build for everyone. And so rather uninspiring and it, a lot of the sort of typical suburbia relationship to this beautiful desert landscape and a lot of an awareness of what would be healthy there. A lot of lawns and swimming pools and things that we now know far better. And the city now has incentives to help people move in the other direction and remove lawn in order to do more zero escaping. But I just, all I had a sense of was that I knew it was a little bit out of the ordinary and that a lot of these places felt manufactured and didn't feel like they had mm -hmm. any real authenticity to culture or whatever in my kind of teenage brain I thought culture was. I thought this isn't it. This isn't what it is, one building that looks like a castle and one building that looks like a pyramid and one thing and that we go into this one because it has a good restaurant. And then the sort of cul-de-sacs and again, suburban, it was like this, there's something missing and I need to get as far away as I can from this to go find it and figure it out. And part of that came from, I grew up in a situation where I was very lucky to travel as a child and see parts of the rest of the country and parts of the rest of the world. Getting to go to Europe in my high school years was incredibly impactful on me in terms of what's possible in mm -hmm. the environment, in terms of beauty and art and a role in that. So actually when I went away to college, I wrote all my essays on being in art restoration because uh -huh. having gone to see the Sistine Chapel among other things, I thought the idea of taking the oldest, most important works of humankind and refreshing those and making those available for centuries to come to people for people to see and taking works of art and making them alive again so that you could see what the artist was making from times past was just like an, an incredible job. And it would be art and also science, because I always also had a bend toward math and science and things and like the, the both sides of the brain thing. Um, but in my second semester at Yale, taking an organic chemistry course as a prerequisite for this kind of path, I thought, I don't know if this is going to be it. Um, it was very, it felt like I was going to head down a path that was very minutia focused and sitting in a room focusing on, on teeny tiny things in the back of somewhere. And I love the interaction of social space and people with our environment. And that's what I came to be able to define that more as I understood it. But it's about the sort of operation of people within communities, within urban fabric and how space actually defines what kinds of interactions are possible and how we relate to one another. And so it felt, okay, that, that path wasn't really going to lead me there. And what I discovered really quickly through just super fortunate circumstance by taking a intro to architecture class with my roommate my sophomore year <laughs> is that architecture actually does exactly that that is what architecture it's is what about it does in, in a lot of ways yes and I was just smitten so I hadn't I had known I was interested and I'd always been into drawing and things but like finding architecture in a way of thinking spatially but artistically like that's the side of it that I came into and just super fell in love quickly majored in it which at Yale is just a bachelor of art so you only actually take two years of studio which I felt was just scratching the surface so I was yeah. like I'm going and you're still doing school. studio um, every day yeah. yeah exactly exactly it's never really left it's yeah never then. left studio and I, somehow my evenings still feel that way every now and then and so I went to Harvard GSD for grad school felt like that would be a little bit of a different environment while still in uh, so much richness of historic thinking and architecture and also just having uh, international influence on that school was really appealing to me. And that's where I met Ryan and DK, who are the other partners of Low Design Office and Ryan is also my husband. So obviously that was an incredibly impactful move. We were all drawn together by interest in the way 
architecture can touch real communities. And I think we felt a little bit like the education we were getting, at least in the early part of the sort of core curriculum of the GSD was focused on understanding formal ideas and manipulations and attitudes toward architecture and didn't feel like we were actually seeing how that connected to being on the ground and doing real things that mattered to, to real people. So that was the lens in which we got to know one another. Ryan and DK were there first. They started before me and are a little bit older. So they had actually formulated the idea of low. Carefully, we should explain this part carefully because low design it's, office is Lodo, which is the name of Ashley and Ryan and DK's partnership. It is. And it's very intentional and stems back again. This is like 2006. So a little bit before we had any real work that we were doing outside of school, but the ideas were there. And what Ryan and DK had been discussing was that a lot of high art and through this class they were taking together really borrows from on the ground grassroots kind of low art or low making out of necessity and then co-ops it and create something that is considered high art and really high thinking design. And what if we could have an approach that is really focused on being authentic to that ear to the ground, low thinking, understanding resource constraints and being innovative from that, but not trying to appropriate it into something else, but just being really authentic to what that requires and needs and how we can serve people in that way. So, so, so can you give me thinking about realizing, yeah. go ahead. I wanted to say, can you give me an example of that? So you, in a project approach, it, give me the example of what taking, how I see it, innovation always starts with a, a point, first of all, let's say there's creativity and, or there's creation and innovation. Innovation is taking something and improving and and bringing it forward into a new context or into new uses. Creation is like a whole other thing in the scientific world. So then we, we go into, we'll call it innovation, and especially with Load Design Office, where you're looking at the environment, the landscape, other things that have been taken as forms into high art. And when you start approaching a project, how do you take a low approach to start with, to work yourself into, I'm going to say high art because anything that's custom designed has really strict purpose to it. It, it. it might be flexible, but there's a very channeled path that you're headed down, not with the design innovation, but with the outcome and need. And it's a learning journey to get to the final piece. So can you give me some kind of an example of how you start something with that thinking and then it ends up being this wonderful thing over here with that thinking as part of what goes on. Like, how do you start the conversation? That's a great question. <laughs> I think there's a few components to that. One is like aggressive listening and inclusion. And I, I think there are still um, a lot of practices or ways of approaching architecture that sort of feel like the architect knows a bit more how to address certain kinds of challenges. So we should be careful about how much we open up the process to others who might not know as much as us about the right way to achieve certain goals. How, how do we get um, what we want otherwise? And yeah. And I think that the, an alternate approach to that, which we have actually had challenges with some collaborators feeling like we're being too open is saying, no, we want everyone to be on this team with us. We are helping facilitate with the skills that we have, but we are not assuming that we know more about what anybody needs or a way to do it or a way to get to this final goal than anybody else. And so we're going to be really radically open and inclusive about participatory conversations and designs and charrettes with everybody who might be involved in the project at the table. When it's someone's home, a uh, private residence that's still a rather small group. But as soon as we get into other types of organizations or work, that can rapidly expand and you can have really different conversations with different folks. And again, we've run into it where someone said, I don't know why we need to get those users involved or those that particular staff group or that whoever, because they're not really the decision makers. And our response is always that in the information gathering stage and understanding how people really operate and what they need, this is so critical. 
and we'll talk about one example of this with a project that we're working on now and, and bringing into construction hopefully soon. And so part of it's that open dialogue and just really inclusive process. And then a lot of it is also being really pragmatic about what we have at hand. What are the resources? What is the real sort of location, situation, benefits and constraints of a given site project? So that we're talking about real materials, real strategies that respond to the climate from the very beginning, just basic sort of good design, but really focused on that from day one about performance optimization, resource optimization, ideas of optimization. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing I would say about a process that's going to stay low and stay effective is just making sure that at every stage we are systems thinkers. So we're trying to get beyond just solving for one issue in one place with one strategy, but leveraging the work we've done to date and thinking about the larger arc of our practice moving forward with ways that can actually benefit a broader audience and be more accessible to more people. Can we be thinking about systems of design, systems of construction that will be more effective realize more with less, all of that. So the systems part of it is a really big one for us as well, mm -hmm. in terms of how we just every, you know, it's Monday morning, we just had our, our daily or our weekly kind of call together. And that's is always threads of, of what you'd hear as we're looking at projects together and um, bouncing around ideas and thinking about how to push forward most strategically with them. Yeah, wow. I love it. I love it. And the aggressive listening piece and getting everybody's voice uh, there's a part of me that fills with fear and there's a part of me that fills me with excitement. And I think the fear part is, did I hear everybody and did I manage to, this is definitely my issue, get the, the what I needed to get from that piece. Did I interpret it well, not necessarily into drawing, but into understanding. I say, say for instance, it needs to feel peaceful. What does that mean? What's peaceful mean? It means something to me and it means something to you because we have our own understanding of peacefulness and in certain landscapes, other things would be more, some things might be more peaceful than this in my interpretation. And when somebody mm -hmm. says it, I have one of the things I, I find very amazing is I like to ask questions like that in front of people so they get all their body language and get all their reactions but doing it with m multiple people I'm like say I've got to tick a box here I've got to tick a box here that's a, an absolute skill in itself like that deep empathy and as you say aggressive listening which yeah yeah you have to embrace to cross the line and then you have to interpret it somewhere it's got to mean something that is interpretable, that still gives the person who brought it to the conversation a feeling of inclusiveness and being heard and understood. There's a thing that Oprah, in her last show, when she did her last Oprah show, I think it was, and she said, out of all the people in the world, there is one that she's interviewed, there was one thing that everybody had. And I'm like, that really put me on the edge of my chair. And it was, they all needed to feel heard. Mm. It's as easy yeah. as that. And that. But that's what you do. Not only do you make them feel heard, you probably make them feel understood. And then somehow you have to take that ball of string and make it into something completely different. Yeah, it doesn't stop with the, with the kickoff. It has oh, to be part of the whole all the way. and the back and forth and the nonlinear. And yeah, it is. Like we as the architects know that our voice will get heard. We're getting to design a thing that's going to be yeah. creating space in the world for people to inhabit. So we don't really need our voices to be the loud ones when we're actually trying to work through the ideas and the goals. Because we'll get to, as you're saying, that's the skill set that we bring is being able to bring together the ideas and filter them and understand what that actually means for creating space. And yeah, it's like a fundamental human condition. We want to hear ourselves and feel empowered that our voice matters somewhere, that someone will hear it and, yeah. and that it will impact something. But, uh, and that's just such a fun part of the process of what we get to do too. Because it's all discovery. Yeah. And it's, again, it's all people. Like everything yeah. we all do, like it's all people. 
Yeah. Um, people are fascinating and they, un- and there's so much that's common to absolutely everybody. We just want to be well. We want our families to be well. We want our opportunity to be the best version of ourselves in the world and communities to feel like they can be something to be enjoyed and cherished together. Um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be overly complicated, but there are so many factors that make that complicated mm-hmm. that are challenges to that kind of wellness for people. So how do we sift through that and untangle it and try to do our part to alleviate and make things better? So somebody oh. coming to Load Design Office needs, they know or they're going to get heard and understood. And that could be a large group or it could be one person or a few people. I think Yeah, it's... we've got a nice set of different centers of gravity on scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that does give you just the start point that is very human centric, which I'm figuring architecture should be, but very human centric and then also environmentally centric because of it's sitting somewhere. What whatever's going to happen is happening somewhere. And then how do you take the same approach from there? I had somebody, and I might have been Jess Devers, said to me, what would, I can't remember exactly who it was, I'd have to look back in notes, but what would the land ask for? And I was like, what? <laughs> and if everything had a voice, if, every, if everything had a voice that it could tell you, and, or you could find a way to listen to everything so it could tell you, because beyond the, the spoken voice, it's like the feeling voice. It's the it's like the body language thing. Like I, I often talking with people, I'm looking to see when their eyes light up, when their nose wrinkles, when those things yeah. happen. Like what what just happened there? What touched that we brought them alive? That and you just don't see that if you're on screen to screen off, and you just you miss too many of those things as easily. Don't feel the energy. Our mm. partner, yeah, our partner DK is half Ghanaian. His father is from Ghana, and he spent a lot of his childhood. He was based in the United States, but going back and spending time with his family there, and now still has a deep relationship to West Africa, and that's been a mm-hmm. lot of his focus and where he'd like to grow design thinking and again the grassroots understanding the specific healthy African urbanism approach to the developing continent. And all that is to say that he comes from a background that is spiritual in a way that mine is not. And it's always enlightening to me to hear him listen to things differently. Like he will, when we visit a site for the first time, he will speak to the trees in a different way than I can. I I respect them and I think they're treasure and all of that, but he will actually have sort of a dialogue and say, this tree wants. He's got a different way of relating to all the elements of our planet and the universe. And it's one of the really inspiring reasons that I love working with the partners that I do, because I actually learn a lot still every time I'm with them, every time we spend time together and our approaches to things Mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. And I can't underscore that feeling enough that to work with people who lift you up or get you excited or just Uh, create that sense of inspiration is so important. And also just sense of trust. I'm married to the other partner. So there's no one I trust more on this whole planet. We've decided to put our entire lives together (laughs) and make them whatever they will be over the can't even escape at work. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. And we're, we are always asking ourselves, like, why do we do this to ourselves? It really makes certain things more difficult just in the household, but it also is like at the big level, of course, like we are together because we care about the world in a similar way. And we hope to, participate in the world in a similar way and so like we wanted and we trust each other more than any other human yeah. so let's be doing this together uh, yeah I feel that, really lucky in in that way i'm so glad you shared that uh, like it's uh, i don't have ever asked that question before of anybody who's come on the show like you know take me on that journey from there I think it's really cool, really cool. It's got me writing down a few names here, people to introduce you to as well. (laughs) So fun. Yeah, And and as anyone knows who works really closely in multiple ways and has like a deep relationship with someone, like it's it's not without its challenges to underscore that too. You know, Uh, we all have to, to work through us being different people and wanting sometimes different things. And so how do we come up with priorities for all of us to row together? that's the, the way we'll be strongest and be able to most amplify the work we do. But it's 
yeah, not without its challenges as well. Of course, of course. But that actually, anything that brings a level of friction brings a level of growth. And like it, it as long as you're moving in the same overall set of values and determined outcomes in some pieces, the growth comes from the perspective, doesn't it? And that you said aggressive listening. And I'm like, that is like it, it it's not a passive thing, it's an aggressive thing. It's we will do this. It needs to be done. It needs to be done rigorously. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Take I me have on. a sticky note that says you can't grow and be comfortable at the same time. Because yeah, isn't that like, true? Oh, it'd be nice if this were easier. But yeah, if you care about what you do and you want to keep pushing it, you gotta get out of the comfort zone. I find that yeah, I find that my comfort zone, I love talking with people, obviously. And my comfort zone of that is the conversations that we share is learning something new from people. But there's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to take it and actually enact it and to grow from it. Like there's tons of, if, if I was the only listener of my own podcast, I still get something from everybody I talk to. It doesn't matter if nobody else listens kind of thing because I get it. And that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. like for me, it's this is like I get a, a lesson in something from somebody who is passionate about what they're talking about. Just about everybody on the show is passionate about what they do and they are, they're driven to make it better it's not they're not just turning up for the paycheck they're turning up because they want this to happen and they want other people to be able to get a better outcome because of what they do and there is so many maybe chat gpt will write me a book one day that just has all these little highlights of pieces that yeah are like little learnings and then the common threads and stuff between them like you'll tell me one thing you just said about DK and his connection with the landscape and trees and he will talk with the land he it, it's purposeful and I totally get that totally get it I don't know too many people who do get that but being able to um, do that is yeah it's like that question what would the land ask for What's it asking for? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what you were just speaking about makes me think about uh, intrinsic motivations versus extrinsic. And yeah, we're so lucky to work with so many people in this profession that are intrinsically motivated to do these things. Like you said, if no one else listened to this podcast, I know I can tell, like you, you still do it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but everyone else benefits because you're driven to do that. And yeah. it's such an important part of, I don't know, us figuring things out for ourselves. I went through a really big process of deciding what I was doing with my life two years ago, because we haven't totally gotten there yet. But I graduated from grad school and started uh -huh. working with Ryan and DK right out of school. But as I mentioned, I hadn't ever had any other sort of long term job. I just had some summer internships. And so three years into it, I, we had a moment where there was one, a lot of friction. We we're right out of grad school. Lots of debt, not a lot of money living in a friend's bedroom, <laughs> trying to build our first house design build together. Um, because we also do design build because why wouldn't project. you do and that? It was, yeah, it was all the things, we lots of learning, and also it was tough. And I also realized that it was going to be a long path to get to do some of the type of work that I was most excited about coming back to the sort of more social, public spirited bits of our fabric. So I decided to leave low design office it was always my moonlight job but to take a job with another firm like Plato architects to work at a firm proper and get some experience on different kinds of projects and and learn from another kind of mission driven company and what i thought would be a very short foray into just getting a little experience and then coming back turned into 10 years over 10 years with Plato because it was an amazing place to be and i was so yeah. lucky to work with just incredible people and incredible projects and then I got to this decision making point a couple of years ago where I could tell I needed to figure out for myself am I committing to this am I marrying you were, Plato you were now? ready and this is my yeah work. yeah there is a time to to go and it was like that thing that that motivates you and it was like okay this is going to make our life a little bit more 
challenging on some fronts in terms of financial stability, having all our eggs in one basket, and also just the type of work we're trying to do. It's not, it wasn't, it couldn't be about some of those extrinsic factors. But ultimately, that's where I realized after lots of time spent thinking about this, that it, yeah, those aren't the things that like got me out of bed in the morning as much. It's like knowing that we're going to spend our time doing something meaningful. Yeah. And also for us, how we are spending time period and in this phase of our life, we have young children and the idea that I could really be a little bit more in control of doing things that I thought were mattered and made more sense rather than, for example, at a large organization being on Zoom calls all day long Yeah, because of governments and all that is complicated at bigger organizations and takes a lot of time. But it helped me get clarity about what was motivating me and that I would be, I would feel better if I just tapped into those more as opposed to going another way of just the comfort, like going the comfort way of, okay, better paycheck and steadier environment. Yeah. Progress, yeah. But, but maybe not getting to feel like all these hours that I spend in the day were exactly how I'd want to be spending them. I think that's a real sense of having to complete your mission as well, or, or, or it wasn't your original mission. It was like it was a, a deviation. But what better place than you know, Lake Plato to do it as well? There'd be, a, there'd be a handful of great firms that you could go and do things like that. And Lake Plato is certainly incredible. I've, I've only really ever met Ted. And just, yeah, in, incredible. And the passion for architecture, the yeah. passion for the environment, the passion for just doing great work yeah. and thoughtful work. It's why they are who they are, I suppose. It's why we all know it their is, name. And it's real. Yeah. And again, that's another inspiring group to work with because they that's real. Like it permeates all conversations and decisions yeah. about projects and how yeah. will this help us keep pushing forward our goals yeah. in terms of um, building good, healthy, sustainable environments. And, yeah. and that yeah. was really incredible to see how that could operate. I was at the firm while it grew from about 50 people to about 150 over the wow. 10 years and in different spurts. And so it was really incredible to see how that can scale mm -hmm. and not saying that low design office is aiming to be that, but the way that you can amplify and then find that message in different types of projects and continue to impact different kinds of communities and users, definitely something that I'm excited about and where my center of gravity now lies in low design office in terms of bringing our approach to different kinds of projects. Yeah. 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 And having such a good sort of piece of pedigree to step off from into that as well is really lovely. We actually met through House Zero or Zero House, which was yep. a Lake Flado project with Icon 3D. Do you want to share about that? Sure. And I can pull up a little bit of visuals here if helpful as well. Awesome. So that you yeah. can see what the, this, what the um, project is. You tell people a little about Icon 3D's processes and stuff and then what they were, what was the brief? How did it end up this way? Sure. So Icon is a company here based here in Austin that is focused on building automation systems in service of, of building more houses. But we as a people desperately need more housing on this planet so that people can have dignified uh, proper structures to live in. And they, their sort of starting point or point of entry for that um, set of innovation is through 3D printed concrete. So where you take the big robots and you feed a tube of concrete to it and it actually following a computer generated path prints layer by layer. And it was a, a real thrill to get to work with them. First of all, because we had a relationship with one of the CEO, one of the founders from his prior ventures and knew that we were really aligned in, in sort of priorities and ways of working. And so this project House Zero was their first project that was trying to bring 3D printed concrete into kind of an upper middle market type of house to say, this isn't just for people who have no other options or disaster relief housing or things like that, which had been more of the, the types of projects they printed. This was meant to say, any of us could really love and want to purchase one of these homes or work with them to build these and communities that are built using this technology, you know, more rapidly, more sustainably, or, or some of their goals um, would, would be a benefit. And so there was a competition. We entered it along with two other firms and were chosen because the way that we approached it, I think, struck a balance that was appropriate for this stage mm -hmm. of, of where they are, of leaning into the concrete being 
something that can be very different because it's printed layer by layer from this big printer, it can be curvy, it can be organic, the beads can be offset, you can make shapes, you can do all kinds of interesting things that very few other building materials really lend themselves to efficiently. And at the same time, we paired that kind of thinking with a lot of nice rhythmic timber structure, that's what's shown on the screen right now, that would feel like it has a familiarity to those looking for a, a beautiful home. Thinking about the bungalows that are throughout Austin and timber construction and the warmth of that. So it's got a simple flat roof, rhythmic structure and wood that touch and play off of the sort of contrast with the concrete. And it was a lot of fun to work with them at every stage of this because it was also the big ideas of how do we optimize what you're doing? The walls that you're printing yeah. theoretically should stand for a hundred plus years. This is a single family home what parts of it really should stand for that long? What parts should be interchangeable in 25 years when someone wants to renovate the kitchen? What parts of it should be something you could build on top of and add density later? So we had a lot of great oh. conversations around that to determine where the concrete was used, mostly on the envelope, and then what uh -huh. other types of finishing out the house we did. So you can see in the main room, um, we were working with scales. It's a 2,000 square foot house with three bedrooms. So nothing overly grand, really trying to right size it, had this Usonian house kind of inspiration. And on the left side of the image on the screen, you see the curve of the concrete, which is the Western wall. It's forming a great sun buffer there with good R value. And on the right side is the sort of entertainment wall and then the kitchen, which are typical stud, uh, stud framed walls. So that again, those can be changed out or manipulated as the the software of the home needs to be updated further down the road. And then there's so, a lower wood ceiling coming through. That's where the kind of main spine of all the, the guts of the home is in terms of ductwork and conduit and piping. And so again, it's something that could be changed without necessarily having to edit this concrete structure. So with that, um, it's beautiful, by the way, just footnote, anybody who's listening that is wondering what we're talking about. If you go to YouTube, you can find Talk Design on YouTube and you will be able to see exactly what Ashley's sharing with us here. It is stunning. Like it's a beautiful, simple home, but with those concrete, I don't even know what you call them, the concrete columns at the front. The columns seems to be the really the wrong word. What do you call them? Those big curved sort of structural elements there, but the softness of them, they almost look like they're, you're made of fabric the way they're moving or not moving. They look like they're moving and the way the shadows form on them and stuff. They've been called tree trunks. They've been called yeah. elephant feet. I've heard a lot of different versions because they, yeah, they have this sort of movement and it's the most fun thing when people come and see the house and they go, oh my gosh, this concrete is so soft. Yeah. And it's really the effect, like you just <laughs> said, it really puts on its head what you would typically think of as concrete where you're about to go see a bunker. And it feels very different in the way the light modulates and plays off of it. And the texture is really fabulous. I, I remember the first time I saw it, and it was probably on social media, I think. I don't know. And I was like, oh, what? And I'd seen some stuff that had been concrete printing and things like that. But just the leap of the materiality that actually, like you say, the rhythm, the size, not oversized, everything mm -hmm. just felt lovely about it and then the softness that it gave out of such a something that's so permanent material such a permanent material structure and then the amount of shadow the amount of what's the word for it because it's pouring out concrete it Isolation. isn't perfectly formed every time like everything is a little bit it's still organic in its nature yeah. and yeah, there's something really beautiful about the, what that brings to the space and the way the light falls on it the way it just Ads, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, we talked a lot about the fact that it's clearly machine made. We know a robot mm. made it, but there's this sort of handmade quality because we got to print this house right at a moment in their technology where there were enough imperfections still that it had almost a handmade look. And I know this drives Icon nuts because they want to be able to control that if they want to have it. They don't want it to be just the default, but we really loved leaning into it that when you really look at these walls, there's a bit of variation in color, which yeah. had to do with changes in the temperature and humidity and therefore the mix they were using that day. Mm -hmm. And then changes in the way that it turns the corner at different times and little, what we call blubs, but they're not 
in our eyes, problems, there were really things to celebrate and make it special. There was one point where a bird landed on one of these planters, and so you got little bird feet oh, um, wow. imprints on the top of the planter, and just things like that. It's like you can't force that to happen or predict it, and it, it is such a nice compliment to the sort of machine AI future that yeah. we're all kind of plowing towards as well. Can we find ways to marry these things? And this was our attempt at doing it at the time. One of, because it's uncontrollable, you get what it gives as opposed to designing everything, like over-designing everything, making, I, I love it. I'd like to thank Stetson Hats Australia for providing my amazing collection of open road Stetson Hats since 1865, John B. Stetson has been crafting legendary headwear, adorning the heads of Western icons like Annie Oakley and George Custer. The Open Road hat debuted in 1937, beloved by artists, outlaws, presidents alike. Its timeless style fits the setting from city streets to open plains. Whether in the cab of a truck or my trusty Mini Cooper, the Open Road is all style. If you think hats aren't for you, you just haven't found the right one yet. Discover yours at stetsonaustralia.com or stetson.com if you're in the USA. Thanks, Stetson, for your support. Please share your Stetson moment by emailing me your photo to talkdesign at gmail.com. Let's celebrate the timeless allure of Stetson together. And when you started doing it, did they, what was the brief? Was it, it was a competition. So in the brief and the competition, obviously there was some sort of parameters about the size. And did Icon mm -hmm. purchase a piece of land to, to do it on? And did you know the site before you designed or did you start with a design and then find the site? How did it work? Been a great question. So they were very specific in what they were looking for, although they had not bought the property yet. They said, design this to be a corner lot in East Austin, 2,000 square foot house with an, what we call here an ADU, an auxiliary dwelling unit, uh -huh. so some kind of small mother-in-law suite. And we said, okay, this all makes sense because when you look at, at East Austin, many of the blocks are pretty standardized, the widths and the setbacks and what can mm -hmm. fit there and the building coverage. And so we didn't have a site, but they were pretty specific and we were very familiar with kind of what that would yield. So the planning for this actually went really efficiently. And it also had to do with, there were obviously many people on the team. It was not just me working on sure, this sure. house. And yeah. some of them were working on another house that kind of informed it. And we just realized pretty quickly, this is what will have to work, both because of the site and the shape of the printing envelope that we get, given the width of the gantry and that you can't yeah. exceed that. But it ended up in this case, it wasn't the printer that was the limitation. It was really the site itself, because once they got it, it was even tighter than we had imagined. So we had to, we had won the competition at that point, then they purchased the site and we had it and it actually had to skinny up even a little bit more. But again, one of those cases where I think constraints lead to really great yeah. innovative outcomes, because yeah. we had to make a little bit more use of some of the unique planning ideas that we had there, the dining room being fully enclosed in this kind of round space that could tuck in right next to the entry, but sort of shape space off of the main one. And um, the way that the carport angles to avoid being too close to the um, uh, curb, but actually keeps it hidden behind this lower wall that we were able to get permitted as just a site wall keeping it below 60. There was a lot of then navigating the process to bring it into reality, but the, the concept stayed very true to that initial competition brief because they were very clear on what they wanted. And I think we just really, our, our way of looking at it really resonated with them. So with that, if they'd chosen, I don't know what the aspect of that corner is, but I, I get doing it on the corner for two reasons. One, one, my marketing brain goes straight to, I've got two frontages to mm -hmm. show everybody what we're doing. The other is yep. if I put it in East Austin, it will stand out enough, but a beautiful tree neighborhood where it will fade back in over the over time, but very accessible for people to come and look at, like very accessible, and, and you're making another show point out of it. But the orientation of the block, whether it was facing north, south, east, west, or where your outdoor living kind of areas or that, how did you challenge that 
once they went, okay, we've got the block? Or did you just choose your best aspect to design to, like we all would, and then go, okay, give that a shot, rather than going, okay, we've got something that faces due southeast and we're going to, sorry, southwest and we're going to have to fight the heat and we're going to, like at this case here, the facade we're looking at is facing west, correct? Yeah. 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 And that's why you've got that thermal um, sort of barrier as well as the passive kind of heating or and cooling that it allows. Yeah, it really went together. If this had ended up facing the opposite direction or something, I, I definitely imagine the design would have evolved a bit differently. Yeah. But it's hard to extract it because we also know that in Texas, the best thing we can do is provide shade. You can mm -hmm. actually make spaces far more comfortable, even in the heat of summer, if you've got some decent shade and breezes. So the big overhanging roof was going to operate in some way here. It really extends quite a bit to the south and the west, and then is a little shorter on the north so that we're not building out bigger than we need to be. Yes. Um, we had talked about having a pergola in the sort of back area yeah. to shade and cover that. And I think if we were oriented differently, that would have been really necessary. But because of the way this is and the, the planting that... Um, developed there with the landscape architect. We had reasonable shade and cover in that north patio without needing to build another structure or extend it. So there were definitely factors that came to play as we fine again fine-tuned it. But the the overall idea that we needed something a little bit more linear mm -hmm. of a plan, both due to the printer shape and the the lot that we figured we would get, I think lent itself to a strategy that would have probably been where we went either way, which was again yeah. kind of like a high roof over the main shared areas and then this lower roof that was also the MEP spine over the kitchen, but also the, over the three bedrooms. So that gotcha. you kind of tucked those in along that longer spine and, yeah. and made good efficient use of that. Yeah, fabulous. Thanks for sharing all that. That's really amazing. And it certainly started to make me think a lot harder about what we would do with 3D printing and, yeah. and where it's going I and what's happening with it. Yeah, I've been really lucky to continue my relationship with Icon. We started House Zero when that company was still under 20 people. It was just at the beginning days. And now for anyone that's followed it, they've done just an incredible job of telling their story and, and gaining investment and interest. So they're now I don't know, 350 people or something like that. And they've, wow. they've grown enormously and have different departments focused on just the mix. How can we get a lower carbon concrete mix or be not using cement? Because that's the, one of the biggest knocks on this, right? Is that it's really heavy on carbon and wherever you print it, it better be staying for hundred plus years in order to make good use of actually using this and justifying this material. Um, and they have entire departments looking at the robots and innovating on those so that their gantry has gotten wider, it's more flexible, and they now have a robot that can print two stories that they think they're going to try to get operational within the next two years on actual client-based work. And so they're doing incredible things with internally focusing different efforts and pushing projects that everyone could look at the icon site and learn more. And then on, on our side, just as designers, getting to collaborate with them on larger scale of thinking, because that's, yeah. again, if they're trying to serve, and we're all interested in helping uh, address the housing shortage that globally we face, how do we start to see this at scale? So the projects that we've looked at with them have now been multiple prototypes being uh, replicated across a site. And we looked at one in the suburb of a Texas city that was going to be 15 homes. We were looking at another one that was a commercial and um, amenity focus of a, of a housing development that would be partly printed. And we're working right now on a project in Moab, Utah with them that will be up to 100 homes trying to serve create workforce housing in a place where there's been a lot of housing shortage because it's just a very small town very constrained environment difficult to get the labor force in there in the first place and it could make a lot of sense to bring a printer in to help rapidly deploy some housing in addition to the fact that i think the aesthetic of printing in the southwest with the oh, plateaus beautiful. and the beautiful yeah. landscapes yeah. surrounding moab would be incredible so yeah. it's been fun to have that be one aspect of some of the kind of material and construction technology driven work that we're doing which again goes into the kind of that systems thinking like yeah. how can we be thinking across projects in efficient ways and learning from these different systems or, or doing different things um, I've got a question with it. So, for instance, one of the things that 
I believe we'll see a massive growth in, and it's always been in the market, not always, but it's been in the marketplace for a long time as modular homes, certainly for getting to different spaces and being able to truck things in and build them in environments where it's controlled. And through the TV show I did, I was out way out, not way out, but out west of, I live on the east coast of Australia and we were shooting a modular home. And I was talking to the marketing manager of the company and you know, she said, how far would a trade have to drive here? If you call a plumber, how long does it take to get one? If you call an electrician, how long does it take to get one? The efficiencies in there. And I said, so where's most of your market? And she's homes like this, because to amass the trades to build a home in this space, otherwise is really hard. And your build time would blow out crazily and then your defect along the way will all take some management point where she said we can truck it in and lift it up and put it down, which generally means it's a very lightweight structure. And I was, when you're talking about it, I was thinking about tilt slab structures and how often they're trucked and craned. And I'm going, so can you print? Could you print this and truck it and crane it as well? Could you take those tree trunks, we call them tree trunks, elephant's feet, oh. elephant's legs, could you take those and have them as a module and then design uh, supposedly with that module and you could go, that's four truck loads, so the efficiency's here and we put it on site, on a slab, I guess, and away we go. I'm thinking like rammed earth, how rammed earth is supposedly of its place, but often not, but it's supposedly of its place and it can be, it's got such a low cement content, it can be knocked back down and, just goes back to the earth it was, maybe with a little few additives. But yeah, just I was thinking of all those other purposes that you could take printed modules for. And do you think that'll happen with it? Yeah. Yeah, they've definitely done some of that. I know of projects that Icon specifically has done where a piece of the project was printed in their factory, in their yep. sort of headquarters, and then brought out to the site to complement maybe the rest of what was printed. And we're looking at that a lot with the different projects that we've been engaged with them is how do we play within the print bed, but then also print something that can be lifted and moved outside of it. So you're not just constrained to that 40 foot width or whatever the current yes. happens to be, but you can take the planters or the continue the site wall or something and lift it and move it. And there's questions there about then what equipment are you requiring on site in addition sure. to the Again, efficiency. Or cranes or things like that, but can you just do it with a forklift? And to what you're saying, how much could you even do in the factory to just ship out to site, have it ready mm. to go? We're fascinated by these ideas. We, we look a lot at modularity. We also, as one of our sort of overarching projects, again, we're always interested in what's like the big project yeah. of Low Design Office, in addition to any one individual kind of effort that we're doing is adaptability and thinking about how we can be creating hardware on the planet that can evolve and adapt so that you're not having to knock it down, reuse it, and actually it can empower the user even to be able to adapt and adjust it to their growing needs as people grow in place. And so it's such a, a major part of what's missing in a lot of our environments is an ability to actually have any mobility to grow in place without needing professionals or a lot more investment or yeah. getting displaced and that kind of thing. I love the yeah. fact that you were saying yeah. with House Zero when you were designing it, knowing full well that this thing will stand for 100 years and in 100 years, how many times will it need to be adjusted and dealt with in different ways because of the fact of humans are on a growth journey, like we're always shifting and changing. And we're going to see a lot of environmental changes and stuff over the next hundred years as well. And how things will need to be adapted. And we just go to Europe. And I think you were saying right at the start about being lucky enough to travel there. And my daughter, who's 22, nearly, just came back from a big solo in Europe. And I wouldn't say she has a big interest in architecture. She does now. And she suddenly realized how buildings make communities as well, and they create cities. And even to the point where she was looking for ways to escape cities, but just how much architecture forms those, and it forms the mood of them, and it forms the interactions humans have in them. And her conversations pre-going versus her conversations we've had while she's been away and she'd just got home, 
it's just it's like I've gone from talking to a kid to an adult who has experienced all these things and seen now how that changes so much in life, how well that's done. And that, yeah, just all those pieces that architecture brings to community and space and place and mood. And I often start conversations with like, it's architectural, any structure is about security first. That's the human need we're solving is security. And that security allows people to have children, to grow, to do things. All these different things happen with security and a level of privacy, a level of that safety again. So, yeah, anyway, getting off track. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so important. It's so wonderful that you're able to have those conversations with your daughter now. I imagine that's super rewarding. It's, and, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of why I think we really love working across different locations yeah. and also learning in that spectrum because the way someone thinks about space or is used to using space in one place is different than our North American United States culture, is different than West African culture, is different somewhere else. But there might be some climate and other factors that actually are similar so we yeah. can think about learning and innovating based on what we can understand happening in one place and apply it to another. Um, for us, one of our current projects is a housing project in Mexico in the Baja Peninsula. And the climate there is a bit more arid, but not dissimilar to some of these that we've talked about, generally warm and dry enough that they really don't, their typical construction doesn't worry too much about insulation or uh -huh. breaks or any yeah. of that kind of thing. Sure. And been really fun to think about how much we can push outdoors there that we don't need to be building conditioned dining areas. Like the table can just be outside. The dining room is an outside room. And there's no reason that the housing that we're trying to develop, which is meant to, to be for a spectrum ranging from workforce in the small town to folks that have now started um, becoming tourists here coming for the different wind sport activities in this pretty particular location that we don't need to be overbuilding those interiorized spaces just because that's what uh, some of the folks that will be coming here are used to. It's actually more about being outdoors in the elements. It's the reason you're there and also part of strengthening community. If we can really have layers of communal experiences before anyone arrives at their particular private unit, and that's always the sort of filter or lens through which you move rather than being able to just park your car and get out in your front door in a very isolated Way. Yeah, so it's more native. We're trying to be as native as we can to the way the the town works, and that we understand people to operate there now. So, but if we could infuse some of that thinking back into a restaurant that's Oaxacan inspired here in Austin that we're working on, and the things that need to be fully conditioned or semi, yeah, it's it all can can. There's so much cross learning, and, isn't there? So the much thing. cross learning, especially the environment's the teacher more than anything. Like the the, the environment will, yeah, yeah. You've got some pictures of that project in Baja, don't you? I think you shared them with me last time. I, this I time, though, I'm them. recording. I'm to pull that up. <laughs> if you've got them handy. <laughs> so now they'll actually get seen. That's um, it. Yeah. yeah, here, let me just pull up a few. of. Uh, I've got that and a couple others if we want to look at them. Yeah. Um, this, again, it's 28 units. And sort of the idea is that the structures stay at a scale and are broken up in a way that feels appropriate to this mm -hmm. town that hasn't really experienced kind of density before. It's right now very haphazard and people coming in, again, there's expats or just with growing economy, other folks building a little structure out on its own in different parts of the town, but without real connectivity or sense of community around those. And so how can we introduce an idea that actually densifying that a bit, allowing this, it's got a gorgeous landscape around it that's yeah. largely Cardone forest and then up into the rolling hills that separate, this is on the Sea of Cortez side of the peninsula and it's mountain range that separates this town from La Paz on the other side. And if we're respectful about that density, if we're clever about using the massing, if it's actually climate responsive, this could be a model for a way of building here that's still leaning into CMU block, that is what we know will be used. It is a readily available labor market and the sort of material that will be used for leaning into shapes and dimensions that work with that. 
but using it not just to create the indoor spaces, but what we've got featured throughout the project are what we're calling these solar wind boxes mm -hmm. that are meant to be helping shade shield from intense cold northern wind that comes through here, but embrace some of the summer breezes and be flexible to be able to either hang fabric or infill and create shade in different ways for the user so that, again, these outdoor spaces are through rooms that can be used. They're just not conditioned and yeah. maximize the ability for it to flex and work that way. Yeah, I so think that's, it's That's a fun fabulous. one that's in permitting right now. Yeah. Do you have hey, to do it's, permitting? It's also really refreshing. Oh, yes. It's, there's a federal level, and that's actually the trickier part, is that when the government changed this year in Mexico, there was an election, and so this uh -huh. is that there were some changes. The, sometimes the rules can really dramatically change. There doesn't, there's not as much process keeping things um, stable. Actually checking to make sure that, again, a little bit of density here, this type of sort of condo development or multifamily development can be done in this town where they haven't really seen this. There's definitely a lot of like checks and balances to, yeah, right. to move through to make sure that it'll have legs going forward before we get final CDs or, or work with the local AOR to completely design it. We'll see. We're really hopeful that it's going to move forward pretty quickly because it does seem positive so far, all the reception yeah. that we've had. And when we've been down there ourselves to help tell the story, um, but we'll have to I'm, go with the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just been talking with a developer about designing a project in Bali and I find all this that you've shown me inspiring in the sense of it's got to be of its place, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things is that there is very little regulation. And so at what point mm -hmm. do you take the, and I'm not going to say over-regulated, the heavy regulated that you live in and that I live in. And mm -hmm. obviously there's so many wonderful lessons we have from learning those regulations and understanding them because they're all around betterment of safety and usage and looking after natural resources. They're not telling us how to design things. They're telling us what we need to look after when we're designing things and then applying it to a place where developers have free reign to play and that should give you a massive innovation, but not at the cost of doing things that are right for, for humans. Still, it's such an interesting conversation to have with people. It is. And it's so delicate. I've worked extensively with developers now since a lot of my projects at Lake Slato were yeah. development, mixed use, hospitality kind of area once we open the Lake Slato Austin office here, especially. And that continues to be a, a lot of my contacts and, and project leads that we're fielding now. And finding that balance of understanding that without development, again, we can't grow into some of these more sophisticated projects that provide some density and amenities that every person for themselves doesn't, yeah. isn't able to put together, but also not seeing that taken advantage of in ways that we've so egregiously seen the market take advantage of in the past to use development as a financial tool more yes. than actually making space for people. Yes. So it's a lot about who you work with and having those mm -hmm. conversations to really get to know their priorities and where their thresholds are, because ultimately for developers, that's their job. They do need to see a return. They often of have course. investors they need to yeah. have a return for, yeah. but at the same time, if they're not doing it to do something greater and have a greater story behind it about what that's providing, then maybe they're they're not quite the right fit for us in terms of what we'll bring and the kind of attention that we'll bring to the project. It, so isn't that, yeah, it's getting to know one another. That's so true. And also getting to know, yeah, that set of values. And also, again, going back to what the land will work best with, mm -hmm. like in this development that you're doing here, you know, high levels of privacy, but then also high levels of community developed into it mm -hmm. you know before you just had the site plan that you flash through and if people go and have a look there you can see how how things are situated to create remember this is a very windy area so situated to create all these yeah. courtyards that you've got wind breaks yes. of the buildings and then also some wind channeling wind and breaks, stuff wind funnels. yeah that's it's, right it's a lot about that and that's how a lot of the, the shape took place. And then also the topography. Yeah. There's a lot of layering to the site from 
page right to left in terms of change and all of that. Yeah. So it becomes something where the, if we were to get way in the depth on this project, which hopefully as it continues and we can speak about it coming into reality, yeah. we could have a whole session on that. Absolutely. The modules became more about, again, the rooms themselves, whether it's an outdoor room or an indoor room and how those aggregate to create little pockets of, of clusters and neighborhoods throughout the development, rather than just any one unit being a stamp and repeat unit. Yes. It's more about the pieces of that unit combining to create the community. And then how do we actually draw the lines of which unit should be two bedrooms or one bedroom or how they should be accessed together or provide more privacy so that we get this spectrum um, and can, and that the units can then be used by a different spectrum or a, a a full spectrum of owners or renters. Yeah. And then also knowing that you're going to have a cinder block construction, knowing your sizes you're working to and the most efficiency you can get out of those and all those kinds of things as well. That systems thinking again that you were talking about, like you've got the systems that are overlaying the land and the environment and then the systems for actually putting it together. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. fabulous. It makes the difference. It makes the difference. It's it's a great looking project, yeah. eh? It is a great looking project, and it it's oh. almost it could be one of the hills behind. It can just blend in with the landscape. Yeah, just holds its That's own. That's the hope is that by building up with the topography, it feels uh-huh. very natural, intentional with the land, as opposed to whoa, you, you approach this and there's some developer came in and built it. Story building on here. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> We'll be excited to share more as it. As yeah, it absolutely. We should, we could keep sharing journeys on these pieces because I think it's really exciting to be able to go, okay, so you enjoyed this. We'll share some more. And this is where it's at. This is what's happening. It's uh, always great to see how things develop out of that. Um, what else have you got for me? I know yeah. you've got uh, lots of other good stuff. Um, Oh, there's uh, all kinds of things we could touch on. <laughs> you, there's a project that you're working on in Austin that we talked about last time where that project is a community project. And one of the things that we touched on last time with it, so it's on the screen now, is that this is a pro bono project that you're doing. And with it being a pro bono project, it needs funding to be built. It will be built. We know that. It's just it needs funding and there's some events coming up, et cetera, to um, accelerate that and get things to happen. But take us from ground zero on this project and then how people can be um, involved in in this project by giving, by enjoying it, by and what its purpose is. Yeah, I would love to talk about this one. Mm. So here in Austin, there is a nonprofit called Casa Marianella that serves immigrants and refugees who have arrived here with no other resources and need to get their feet under them. So they offer about three to six months of housing and services so that they can get paperwork in order, find jobs, get kids in schools, and then make connections and hopefully be able to move into apartments together or or move on from here once they've, again, gotten their feet under them. So the organization is doing an incredible amount of work for a very vulnerable community that's in Austin and is here, but is sometimes I think really not seen given some of um, the changes that have happened in central Austin in particular and some of the homogeneity given how much prices have increased and what that looks like. So we were really thrilled to be introduced uh, to CASA through the landscape architect, Forge Landscape Architecture, because they were interested in designing a new community home with a piece of land that they were gifted by one of their donors. They, they mostly operate off of small donations from many people in order to operate year to year and serve as many families as they can. And this donor actually was able to give them a piece of land on the existing cul-de-sac where some of the other houses that, that some of the women and children live in are now. They have two campuses. The one that we're working on is called their Posada campus. And as I just said, it's, it's strictly for women and children. So it's a safe space for women and children who arrive here. Uh, alone and the building is meant to be uh, on the ground floor a community room that actually gives a space for these families to come together a kitchen that can be shared that's a little bit bigger and has more space for making group meals and a flex sort of porch and living area where tutoring can happen Um, again many of these women come with several children who need 
to be engaged. Uh, they need to get in school, get caught up, and also get um, just have, run out their activities. There will also be run out all of their energy. So there will also be um, a garden area and a playscape that are part of the project, extending that sense of communal space that's really flexible and serving uh, these particular residents. And then on the second floor, a couple more bedrooms, really modest little kitchenette. So that's almost like its own apartment for to be able to house some more folks. But working with as limited a budget as we can make work, because again, this will only be built with money that's fundraised. It won't be possible to predict exactly what that is, but I think we've sent some good benchmarks. And as you said, we're, they're now in the process of fundraising. We've just submitted for permit. So it's in process of going through the city. On that side, the design's fairly well resolved with the help of our landscape architect and a structural engineer, Fort Structures here in Austin, who also donated their time to work on this. And one of the big events coming up, depending on when this, when you're listening to this, it might have passed, but we can put this out very quickly. December, yeah. What right. takes the what, December what 9th, takes 2024. December 9th. That is, there's going to be a concert here in Austin at the Moody Theater with a great lineup. They were fortunate to have a board member who's involved in the music industry here and just has incredible artists lined up. And the proceeds for that will go toward the construction of this. So we're trying to help get the word out about that, help them with fundraising with some of the imagery that we've developed, like, again, along with the rest of the design team, and continue to work with them. This is one of the projects, going back to something we were talking about in the very beginning, that started with aggressive a, listening, a highly inclusive, <laughs> aggressive listening kind of activity, because we wanted to learn who these families are, who these women are that have come here through very difficult, sometimes very dangerous journeys. It's remarkable. We had this event that had French, Spanish, and Portuguese translators available to us wow. to help speak with everyone. And then we printed out a lot of these visual cards so that we could talk about dining, what it means to eat together and kitchens and cooking and what that means in bedrooms and what someone's looking for at this moment in their lives and given what they've gone through yeah. and hear what they had to say. And so many of these women are actually from Africa. They entered the Americas through Brazil and then some of them have been on foot from Brazil to get up to Austin and just can't imagine the journey that they've been on. And so their needs were, it was so interesting to hear the ideas of safety and security coming up, but also just cleanliness, like having a space where they don't have to worry that there will be bugs or mold or problems with the food that they're trying to feed their family, just basic goals about having a space that not only is those things, that is a clean space, but communicates that feeling. As soon as you walk mm. in, it, it's clear that it feels clean and well-kept and safe. And so conversations like that just were really impactful and, and um, interesting to have at the beginning of the project, leading to the development of it overall. And again, the project really focuses on being efficient to construct so that we're not spending too many dollars to do something that has a lot of gymnastics. This roof has the same set of rafters all yeah. the way down, a simple rectangle. And the one kind of playful move underneath is that community room popping out at an angle so that you can mm -hmm. really create a dynamic porch that kind of acknowledges the street side where this is a view looking from the street, feels welcoming and inviting. And is also, that's actually in line with the rest of the garden and playscape that responds to the neighboring fence line and house that it faces. And what in the front here is also a bit of transparency. This is the idea that to access what I call the apartment upstairs, it's a semi-conditioned space. It's not actually fully air conditioned, but just a perforated metal screen around a fun sort of front porch stair that could become really active and another place for kids to play, gather. I was about to noise, say, it's another place. Still be sheltered. Yeah, exactly. Another, yeah. Uh, all of that is just like places for people to be together, but also not feel overly exposed uh -huh. or on display. And that's the idea of the design is that when you're back from the street, it's not shouting or, or calling too much attention to itself, but that we do get to play. The idea here is an inspiration from a local artist named Emily Eisenhart, who has expressed interest in collaborating with us on this project um, to have a mural that's very specific yeah. to weaving these multicultural sensibilities and energies that exist here in a way that's, that celebrate that. So it's mm. been a really wonderful process working with the organization and now actually trying to help them get the money together to see it break ground in the new year will be really exciting. So by the time I get there late in the year, I should be able to see it next year. 
I'll be there early next year, but late next year we should be able to visit it. That would be cool. That would be cool. In October. -ish. This is another one that we Oh, wonderful. I'm so excited yeah. that you'll be here. And yeah, we're our goal is to be the general contractors on this. So to do this design build oh, and okay. break ground as soon as we get that permit to go through, hopefully yeah. again very soon in the new year. So we would be well underway when we see you in the fall. That's awesome. For people who are listening and can't come to the Moody Theatre, can you tell them, tell me how they can donate, how they can put money towards your project? That would be a really key thing. I want to give the example of we support, as a family and as businesses, we support an African in Uganda, a couple of businesses, or when I say businesses, a couple of charities that we support. And one of the biggest things that, always comes out is how do you get the money to projects? Like in this case, yes, you've got the Moody Theatre gig, that's going to be X amount of income of X amount of ticket sales, etc. But when people want to be able to go, okay, what can I give? And if it's money's one thing, but what other resources might you need for this? And how can they engage and give that to you so that it makes not just this project, but in this case, this project, but other projects like this fly. What's the path? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because I know that, yeah, people are all moved to want to mm -hmm. do good for their communities, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to find the way that we can best actually fit that in time-wise, financially, whatever it is. And so casamarianella.org is the organization. I'm sure if you look it up, you could get to their page and there's simple ways to donate through that. But the construction, again, will be through fundraising and hopefully through some material donations or other participation from suppliers. So if someone's listening that says, we'd be willing to do a package of, I don't know, lumber is probably going to be pretty local here in Austin, but uh -huh. you know, the windows or the doors or the a finisher or something that we'd really love to participate by helping contribute. I think that is a conversation that we're really excited to have and start putting together within the overall construction budget. Also the plant one, just yeah. having people come out to help plant the landscape when that's yeah. ready or help tend to it and take care of this garden. That's going to be an incredible resource for again, families who are far from home, but could plant something familiar and then cook with it with this garden, but that'll need maintenance to get it going and, and overall maintenance to, to keep it going. It's like a, big, a bigger overall call to just wherever you are, Make your community better by yes. time to time, really dedicating some energy to it. I think in, in the case of this, having something like you say, like this landscape that you know, it will have edible parts of the landscape, etc. That actually gives people a chance to be in this community and always be a part of this community here that is moving through in three to six month chunks. And it gives them that ability to to bring those people that come to here back out into the community, like not just in this yeah. piece, it integrates them back out into the Austin community where they're going to add all the value that they can bring and they're going to bring all the culture and the diversity and the understanding and the acceptance. I think that's the, yeah, that's the real magic of anything like this. And having... Yeah, a, I've been a, out here to just help yeah, trash or whatever you know you can do and, yeah. and fit in on a, a couple hours of your time um I, and it can be really helpful because I, when i did that last i was teaching at ut austin and i brought my students we were talking about multiculturalism and uh -huh. adaptation on a very layered level and so i wanted them to know this existed and that these people are here and so they came out and we picked up trash together and then another day we did some tutoring exercises with some of the students some of the kids there and just be my, as possible. my youngest oh. daughter, um, Australia has quite a few refugees that come to Australia. There's um, you know, a recent amount of immigration that comes to Australia every year. Australia is trying to find people. I shouldn't say trying to. It's finding people all around the world. And a lot of economies are always looking for growth. And Australia is certainly one of them. And my youngest daughter, she spends part of every it must be her September school holidays she spends working with 
an organization that brings different some from Africa, some from Asia, all around the world, they're coming into Australia and they do certain kind of modules of understanding of what uh, we're in Queensland, certain modules of understanding parts of Queensland. And that's where they're, they're immigrating to is Queensland. And they will be from kids to grown ass men. There's the whole range of things. And they spend... I think she spends it's more it's either five or seven days where just interacting with them, doing different things, activities with them, taking them different places, or going on the journeys to different places with them. And then they have kind of food events and all sorts of things. But a lot is all about them realizing what they're in for, where they are, where they've come to, and how that supports them and how their life will be going forward and what the opportunities are in it. And she comes back 10 feet taller every time. She's, yeah, it is magical. And Australia, it's a, got a very diverse immigrant culture, a lot like America. And with that, she's at the forefront of understanding that or, or being a part of that. At, she's 14 years old. So, yeah, just immersed in it, which is lovely. And that's the kind of opportunities that places mm -hmm. like this bring is this cultural understanding and difference and growth and um, acceptance of different culture that ultimately builds our cultures better. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. If what we do can help bridge divides, like this is a, a major yeah. human condition yeah. that also we all need to be helping think about how we're participating in and doing with our everyday lives as well as our careers because it's, it creates so many challenges when we feel deeply divided and deeply separated from one another. Yeah. But we're not actually. Why not? We're all humans yeah. breathing the yeah. same air. Similar things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, yeah. We're all humans. Yeah. We're all doing, we've all got bottom line, similar outcomes that we want from life. Like you said, you just come back to the simple things of what life, what we're looking for from life. And then, we're all breathing the same air, drinking the same water, swimming in the same sea. It's all on this one planet. What, whatever we can do to make that a better place is... I think that all of us in the design field are incredibly lucky to have an opportunity to have some influence over how that community works and aggressive listening. Aggressive listening, I think is key. <laughs> Yeah, we're lucky we have a chance to think about these really big ideas in a, I don't know, so many people are critical of a cheesy save the world way, but if you don't start with these big ideas, then yeah. what's the framework? I think, I, gotta, I love your genius of being, possible. yeah, exactly, and your genius of being able to take big, or big ideas and distill them down to small ideas, and right down to how does a kitchen support five different cultures that may cook in it how, do, how does this happen how does the bathrooms do that how do whilst we've got our western uh, sort of doctrine on how those things happen and we probably figure we've worked out the best ways how they're appropriate how they're appropriate mm -hmm. as we move forward does everybody just shift to what we do and that isn't always going to be the answer because we don't learn from anything along the way yeah, we didn't get into it this time, but micro architecture is another one of our kind of oh goodness themes. We have so to do like it. Thinking small, the power of thinking small. It's part of being low. And if we had really time, I want to do that because the power of thinking small is also the power of making more value out of less. And mm -hmm. as ever as a planet, we need that now. We've always needed it, but we need it now. And we have so, so many more um, resources and knowledge and stuff that can come together on this thinking small. Where I live in Queensland, we live in a very stable climate and in the part that I live in. And people still build huge homes where we could actually build way smaller homes. We may have a lot of roofed area, but those are outdoor roofed areas. It, but the actual footprints of our homes don't need to be anywhere near the size they are in Australia and New Zealand and America built the biggest homes in the world for their people. That's we're we're both famous for it. And we don't yeah. need well, to Well you got it. You're thinking low. 
Yeah. Thinking small. Let, let's have a whole conversation. With Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Ashley, I know you've <laughs> got to go. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Adrian. I so enjoy this. Oh, yeah, me too. Me too. And I would love to speak to DK and Ryan. I'd love to get you all on at some point and do that other conversation. Yeah, and in Kiru, she's our fourth leader yeah, and first, bringing on and even another perspective. It's a it's an incredible dynamic to, again, honor to get to work with the people that you get inspired by. Yeah, aren't we all? Aren't we all? So thank you so much. Go and have a wonderful, you've got evening, I've got day. I'm sitting yeah. in New Zealand <laughs> at the moment, so I'm, yeah. I'm, it's actually cold compared to where I left. Hang in there. Enjoy yeah. that. I will. Hey, take care, and we will talk very soon, and I hope to publish this next week. That's the plan. Thank you. I'll be thrilled. Cheers, I'll hon. Send you whatever you need to follow up. Thank you, Adrian. Bye. No. Thank you for tuning into our conversation. I hope it left you both informed and inspired. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen. And please don't hesitate to share your design thoughts with me. It's always a joy to hear from you. If you're like me and crave a deeper dive into design thinking, coupled with a love for travel and adventure, consider one of my architectural adventures. Join me and some of my wonderful design friends and embark on a journey of a lifetime. Apply for an unforgettable design experience at adrianramsey.com. With our clients spanning the globe, I firmly believe behind every great project of great people. If you're a great person and seeking to turn your dream into a reality, I'd be honored to design your home with you. Why not join the ranks of our exceptional clients and let's make your heart sing. Reach out to me at studio at ardesignhouse.com that's studio at ardesignhouse.com and let's get a conversation going and make your heart sing